Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the Wednesday study for this week. As we continue to proceed in Daniel 10, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his direction so that we may more properly come to an understanding of what we are finding here, both in Scripture and what Uriah Smith had written about this book. Shall we now bow our heads for a word of prayer? Loving Father in heaven, there are many things we yet do not understand. We know that we have sinned. We know that we fall short of your glory. We ask now, Father, for your direction and your guidance. Help us in our continued study in the book of Daniel. Direct us in that which you would have us to do. May your will be done. May our hearts be open to receive your instruction. May your angels join with us, protect us, and may your spirit enlighten us in this conversation. Help us now, for we know that time is short. Guide us in all things that you would have us to do. For this we thank you, and this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we were leaving off here at verse 17. After a good conversation with what we were having toward the end of the day yesterday. Now, when we, when we look at this, I think we can all agree that Smith did not recognize what vision was occurring here. And if he did, then he was not willing to give credence to the vision that Daniel was referring to. Because in verse 16, He states, and behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. Now, when we're looking at this and we're addressing this, we recognize that there are three visions being addressed within the book of Daniel, especially in verse in in chapters 8, 9, 10. And 11. And verse 16, the vision that we're talking about here, the Mara, is the vision of the 2300 days. And it's from that vision that Daniel is quite, is sorrowed. For how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straight away there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Smith comments, one of the most marked characteristics manifested by Daniel was the tender solicitude he felt for his people. Having come now to clearly comprehend that the vision portended long ages of oppression and suffering for the church, he was so affected by the view that his strength departed from him, his breath ceased, and the power of speech was gone. The vision of verse 16 doubtless refers to the former vision of chapter 8. Now, when we are looking at latter and former, latter, L-A-T-T-E-R, meaning the vision of the first, former, the vision that follows. Would that be correct? Well, yeah. So, um, yeah, if if you're the former is the first one, the latter is the one that follows. Okay. So I had it back. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just think the former is like before, latter is like late. So then Smith is making a direct misapplication because the former. No, uh, yeah. The former vision is the one before. So that's the one in chapter eight. Okay, but we have two visions in chapter 8. Right, but he's just saying, he's just looking at there's one vision in chapter 8. That's that's the point that he's making. He's saying there's a vision in chapter 10, and then there's this vision in chapter 8. That's the former vision. Now, the reason why he calls it the former, because there's a little bit of context. He, he There's these two visions, the one by the Uli and the one by the Hittico, right? So... He, he's not considering the vision of chapter nine, right? He's just saying there's two visions that we we are addressing here. I, I don't know if that makes sense. 
well why he why he looks at those two visions but not the vision of chapter nine even though it's a separate it's not really a vision in the same way that these ones are but you know that's the 70 weeks is is not considered in here but Ellen White does the same thing when she talks about the Uli and the Hittico. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, but when when I'm looking at this, and I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, because in Daniel eight sixteen, just as in the the original portion, the first portion of Daniel eight, he refers to a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, right? Yeah, so, yeah, in chapter 8, right. Now, he's not talking about verse 16, though, but, but just to be clear, because he's talking about the vision of verse 16 of chapter 10. That was referring to the former vision of chapter 8. And we know in chapter 8, in verse 16, that is the one you're quoting, I heard the man's voice between the banks of, of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Now, the vision there is going to be the morale, right? In verse 16. In verse 16 of chapter 8, yeah. Okay, but the vision that Daniel first refers to, where in Daniel 8.1, that speaks in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision, a calzone, appeared unto me, even unto me, Daniel, after that, which appeared unto me at the first. Right. Which which is, what's the one that's the first? Aren't we talking about the vision in Daniel 2? No, nope, because that's not a vision. That's a dream of Nebuchadnezzar. It would be the vision of chapter 7. Okay. And in chapter 7, now in chapter 7, because it's in Aramaic, not in Hebrew, your, your numbers are going to be different. Now, he does have a dream, right? So he says, I right. had a dream, chapter 7, verse 1, 24, 91. But he says, and visions of my head. That word visions is 2376, which is the analog to the Hebrew 2377, two, right? So the word is... Uh, Kazev, but it's just uh, the same as the word Kazon. Right? Okay. So it, it would be the same as Kazon. Okay. So so I saw it in my vision that is in the Kazon, right? So even though it doesn't say Kazon because it's Aramaic, it's still the same uh, thing. So that vision is going to be, you know, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Okay. And Rome, both pagan and papal. So, so and we could say that in chapter 8, when it talks about the Gazon, it's talking about this vision of Daniel chapter 7. That's, uh, that is that vision of the 2520. Because you would have to say then Daniel chapter 7, because it's covering Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome, is covering the 2520. But here in this case, it's not going to start with Assyria, like for the northern kingdom. It's going to start with Babylon. And we we have Babylon starting, as Uri Smith points out in the key to the 1863 prophetic chart. 677 is the date we have for the start of Babylon. So, so obviously, this is indeed uh, the Kazo in chapter 7. So that's why in chapter 8, he's going to say, after which appeared unto me at the first. Right? There's a vision, 2377, right? So obviously it's the same as two three seven six. That makes sense. It's that's entirely logical, okay. at least to my mind. Yeah. Um, so just so um, now, the thing is, Uri Smith doesn't distinguish this. So I, I think though that he is correct when he's talking about the former vision of chapter eight. He is referring to the Marath, right? So he's not referring to chapter seven. Right, that vision, the Kazon, he's referring to what's revealed in chapter 8, which is the Marath. So he is correct in verse 16, it's referring to the Marath, that is verse 16 of chapter 10, which also is in 
uh, verse 16 of chapter uh, 8, right? Make this man to understand the Marah. But we know in verse 15, he says, before me the appearance of a man, That's, that word appearance is also Marah. So it first shows up in chapter 8 as the word vision, right, which is four five. 4758 in chapter or chapter 8 verse 16 but it does appear in verse 15 as the word appearance but it appears as appearance in verse 15 for the first time in that chapter but but he is right so does that make sense that he's right because he is referring to to verse 16 of chapter 8 and that is the morale okay <clears throat> right and, and maybe he does recognize that there is a kazone because he, he narrows it down to verse 16, where it first shows up as the word vision in the King James. So, so I think he is correct, but he doesn't understand the distinction between the kazone and the morat. But he is going to revert, refer to make this man to understand the vision. So uh, hopefully that's clear. Well, I'm not I'm not going to fully agree or disagree with you at this moment because I have two other points. Point yeah. number, point number 1 as we have already considered in the in the past since 2012 this vision especially as it is delineated in verse Daniel 8 verse 2 if we use the the word we would say and i saw a kazon and it came to pass when i saw that i was at sushan in the palace which is in the province of elam and i saw in a calzone and i was by the river Uli. now we've recognized the fact daniel was very much in vision here he was seeing prophetically the fact that Babylon was no longer on the world stage and that the Medes and the Persians had taken the stage. Okay, so uh, so there's a couple of things here. So he's going to say, I saw it in a vision. So he's going to call this a kazone, right? Correct. Himself personally as he writes about it in verse 2. So now we say, well, Babylon is no longer on the stage. I mean, this is going to be 19 years before the fall of Babylon. Right. Okay. So uh, Babylon is still the dominating power in uh, the Levant until it falls, right? Because there's 70 years for Babylon, right? So he, but he's just going to call it uh, the Kazom. So he, he's looking at it as part of the vision of chapter 7. Right. Right. Okay. Right. That, I think, is the point that you're trying to make. Now, of course, Babylon's, Babylon's still there, but he's being brought into the future, right? So he's brought into the time of Medo-Persia when there was Shushan in the palace. That palace did not exist um, 19 years before the fall of Babylon. So, but, but he knows about that palace because when he wrote this, Right, because he didn't write this at the time he had the vision. He's going to write this later on. I think uh, that's fairly clear in the spirit of prophecy. So he would have known it, Shushan, in the palace only because he's been there personally. Now that Medo Persia had conquered Babylon, now it is possible that maybe he had been as in some kind of uh, diplomatic mission. He had been to Persia. And that is possible. But I would think this is more that after Babylon has fallen, when he writes out this vision, he's going to know where he had been brought in vision two, because now he's seen it with his own eyes. But he wouldn't have known that at the time he had the vision. That makes sense. Okay. If, he, if he had not been to Susa, then he wouldn't have known where he was in vision. But if he had been there, then he would know. So either he had been there already, at the time he had the vision, or it's just that when he wrote it down, he now recognized where he had been in vision 21 years earlier. 
Okay. So, so that so so there's not it's not clear, but but we need to be recognizing that 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 this is you know he's he, he shouldn't really know about the Shushan the palace. One is I don't actually think it existed in at that time, from what I understand. The palace in Shushan was a built later. Right. So, but anyway, that's that's uh, one detail. Now, I, I want to just kind of shift gears here for a second because um, there was something in your prayer that that I've been thinking about. Now, you made this mention about um, about the glory. We we don't uh, reflect your glory, or what was it that you said? We fall about short glory. of your glory. Right, we we fall short of the glory of God. And, and I've been thinking about this. We actually did a, a prayer meeting here last night, and we, we dealt with this uh, statement in the spirit of prophecy, which I didn't. I, I just quoted it from memory. Um, but there's in the special testimonies to ministers and workers, it's Ellen White asked the question, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which is not in his power to do for himself. Right, and in the context that we're going to get into here in uh, this Mara vision, mm-hmm. then Daniel has this looking glass vision. Uh, we're we're going to look at that a little bit. There's a whole bunch of verses, but you know, one is when we deal with the looking glass uh, is in Second Corinthians chapter three, where it says, "But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord." are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, which I wish I would have brought this up last night in prayer meeting, but I didn't. Uh, I I looked at some other verses. And then um, we also have this, of course, in James. Is it uh, in James? Yeah. In James chapter 1, for if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face as in a glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he is being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So here we have, of course, again, a mirror, a glass, it was called in the King James. And so, so we have this this Mara vision, and so so it is a vision of a mirror, right? Right, the yeah. looking glass vision, and and it's about the glory of God. So, um, when we're going to address these touches here, it, it's going to be interesting as we go through each of these touches. So, I just want to mention that just because I'm thinking of it right now. Okay. Um, so we're going to have these different visions, the Kazone the Mara, right, and the Mara. So the Mara is the one that he has in chapter 10, right? So you got the Kazones chapter 7, the Mara is chapter 8, and the Mara is chapter 10, all 10, 11, and 12, okay? Right. So we got these three, three different visions. Well, thank you. And I, you know, I don't disagree. But we're, as, as you have pointed out, and as others have pointed out over these last several weeks, many of these situations that are being faced by Daniel or that we have addressed in the book of Ezekiel are personal situations because they have to apply to us first personally and then as a group before a message can be given. Yeah, so so we had a little interesting study. So I, I didn't want to go too much into the study, but um, we looked at you know first um, you know pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall, right? Mm-hmm. And that's going to be uh, Proverbs sixteen eighteen, which is um, the significance of that is one six one eight, which is Fibonacci sequence, right? Five, okay, right. One six one eight is five. So sixteen verse eighteen represents five. 
And and that ties us to Matthew 16, 18. And what's Matthew 16, 18? We, we should know this. This is study. I'm not calling it this early. And I'll say also unto thee that thou art Peter. Ah. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right. So this is that when they're at Caesarea Philippi, which is Paneum, that in verse 17, you're going to have, uh, well, verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you know, and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, Simon, the son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And then he's going to say, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The gates of hell are actually, is a place in Paneum, right? Right. Uh, people are familiar with that. The gates of hell is a place right. in Paneum. So, so that's why he refers to the gates of hell because that's where they are <laughs> in that area. And, uh, but the other thing that was really interesting is he doesn't say, blessed are thou, right? For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Holy Spirit has revealed it unto thee, right? But he's going to say my father. And so I asked the question, why, why does he say my father and not like, you know, God or the Holy Spirit or something like that? And uh, the question, the answer that, that we gave was, um, what other things, well, first with the question, what other things only does the Father reveal? And the answer was, what, what, what other things is it that the Father reveals? In particular, the Christ doesn't reveal that he doesn't even know. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the day and hour of Christ's coming, right? Okay. Okay. So the Father reveals things that are hidden that need to be unhidden. And so in verse 19, he says, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, or that is, seal up, shall be sealed up in heaven, right? And whatsoever thou shalt loose or unseal on earth shall be loosed or unsealed in heaven. Now, People have all kinds of different interpretations of what this means. But the one thing that we can say is that this has to do with the sealing and unsealing of prophecy. Can we agree with that? That that okay. is the key? That, so, so in order to understand prophecy, that has to be revealed to us, at least certain types of prophecy, things that are hidden uh, by the Father. Uh, but, but we can have the key, and the key, of course, is we, we went to Isaiah 22, 22, and um, that's going to be, and, and 3, verse 7 of the Revelation. So we should know what those are. Right. Isaiah 22, 22 is going to be dealing with the keys of the house of David. And, and, and you're going to have a similar type of phrase instead of being uh, bound and loosed or sealed up and unsealed. It's going to say, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open, right? And, and Christ quotes that in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, in the message to the, to the Philadelphian church, right? Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, right? These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. And he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So we should be able to see how these all tie together, right? The keys of the kingdom are, are tied to the keys of the house of David. Uh, it, 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 it's something I'd never seen before. Okay. So, so hopefully you can kind of see that it, maybe it's a little bit oblique, um, you know, in connecting these. It's not as direct as as I would like, but, but I think we should be able to see that this is all tied together, that um, what's being, how to understand prophecy, that there is, now we know that we apply the message of Philadelphia, this door that's open and shut is the door to the holy and the most holy, right? The door to the, to the holy place is going to be shut 
and no man can open it, and the door to the most holy is going to be open and no man can shut it. Right? Do right. you understand that? That's Agreed. Philadelphia in which we get that open and shut door. So, but that open and shut door is understood in the context of prophecy, but specifically the 2300 days. So, so it really needs to be understood what, what is being revealed here and what is being um, uh, illustrated. And we would have to say that in order to understand this, or, or in the process of understanding this, in receiving this revelation, the glory of man is laid in the dust, right? So this experience that Daniel has in chapter 10 is, is an experience that we all have to have. It's connected to prophecy, typically to the prophecy of the Kazone, right? And the 2300 days is part of that. So what this message is supposed to do is to lay the glory of men in the just, uh, in the dust. And it's part of justification. And of course, also sanctification, right? Because without without first having the glory of man laid in the dust, we, we can't have sanctification. So it's the first step. And we know that the first step contains all three symbols. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So first, we have to have our glory laid in the dust. And then we can receive, then we can give glory to God. And and then then we can enter into judgment where this door is going to be shut and this door is going to be opened. So they're all tied together. It's it's quite profound, at least in my mind, of of how these things are coming together in understanding Daniel's vision of chapter 10. So hopefully that's helpful. I mean, we're going to still have to think about it a bit more. It's interesting. And yeah, we're we're all going to have to give good consideration to this. Now, the second point that I was trying to bring out here, Smith writes that having come now to clearly comprehend that the vision portended long ages of oppression and suffering for the church, he was so affected by the view that his strength departed from him, his breath ceased, and the power of speech was gone. Is Smith here in agreement with what Pruitt had stated? No. Now, if Pruitt was correct, that Smith clearly understood what was going on, then Pruitt should have been in full agreement with Smith, but he is not. We are finding many times, and this was pointed out several times from 2009 to 2015, that when others would have disagreements with points of light that were being presented at this time, that they themselves would have disagreements amongst themselves. So Pruitt doesn't understand what he's talking about. Smith here is being very direct, but he doesn't fully understand both of the visions, the one that's being presented within chapter 7 and at the beginning of chapter 8, and the difference between it and the vision that is presented from the middle of chapter 8 forward. And I don't think he comes to recognize the third vision. Now, if Uriah Smith had been arguing against the 2520, he, he might have made the same argument that Eugene Pruitt did. Yeah. Because people often do that. If, if they take different positions depending on what they're arguing, what they're discussing, right? So Correct. here... Obviously, Eugene Pruitt had been thinking about uh, the 2300 days as, well, that's way into the future. Uh, you know, it, it would then, he, he would realize that, you know, he couldn't make that argue, but argument with talking about the 2520, right? But he's right. just considering the 2520 by itself. So, so, but people do that all the time. It's what I called an ad hoc argument. That is, they're just making up an argument 
to win the argument at whatever time. But right. they're not consistent. And so we've talked about that, you know, the idea of this consistency. Now, you know, it, and it still is, it, because part of the question that we've talked about is, so Uriah Smith, obviously, the 2520 was hidden. Now, we could say in part it's hidden because of the fact that they don't see it. And so God hides it on the 1863 chart because if they had seen it, you know, Christ would have come before now, right? Because they would have they would have followed through. The only way that they could have seen it is if they had continued following God after the first disappointment or the second disappointment. If they had the movement had accepted the message, Christ would have come, right? They, they probably would have had the full understanding of these things. Light would have continued to unfold to the movement, the Millerite movement. Uh, and, and to our movement, too, there's sort of the same uh, same idea, the light that's been coming since July 18th, of course, is, is a great revelation because everything that happened before July 18th is now clearly understood. There's so many things that we didn't understand until after July 18th about our own message. But um, it, for Eugene Pruitt, he doesn't have the same excuse as Uriah Smith does. It is, he's, Eugene Pruitt's presenting in a time which, in which the 2520 is being understood. Now, you know, I mean, it's just a few years after it starts to be understood, but he had the opportunity that Uriah Smith does not have this unfolding of light, he, he could look at, you know, there's two 2520s and, you know, there's a prophetic mirror. You, you, Eugene Pruitt never addressed the prophetic mirror. Like he, he's, he's addressing, now we could say it's a little bit, you know, unfair to expect that he's going to understand everything that we now understand. He definitely, um, we weren't teaching the four seven tons and all that back in 2009. And, you know, and that's when the book is published. Maybe he wrote the book even a little bit earlier for that section. Uh, but he still had the opportunity. He could have been the one who uncovered the four seven times uh, rather than somebody like me, right, or Jeff, right? He, he could have uncovered it. And he could have been presenting in this movement or even not, not in this movement. He could have just been presenting it and there would be other people understanding the same thing but but he doesn't and and the reason so i'm getting back to what i was talking about is that we cannot uh understand bible truth until the glory of man is laid in the dust right and i think that has been the problem it in this unfolding of truth is because our glory is what we're seeking instead of Christ's glory. In, in, and, and sometimes God gives us light and we think that that light comes from us, right? And, and, and that's the, one of the dangers of receiving light is that, you know, the light comes from God. It can be revealed. And in, in the story of Peter, remember that the name Peter, uh, P, the letter P is the 16th letter of the alphabet, E is the fifth, um, T is the 20th, and R is the 18th letter. And if you take uh, 16 times 5 times 20 times 5 times 18, we get 144,000, right? So Peter right. represents 144,000. That makes sense? Yes. And it's going to be the Father that, so he represents us. In, the, in that story, in 16, verse 18, chapter 16, verse 18 of Matthew, um, where it says, thou art Peter. He's actually going to be said Peter, right? He's actually called Simon Barjona in verse 17. But he's going to say, Peter, thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and I shall give you the keys of the kingdom, right? That which, you know, you bind shall be bind on the earth shall be bound in heaven, that which shall be loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, right? So we have this this connection between the open and shut door, between prophecy, all these different things. And then Jesus is going to talk about his his death. 
And what what is Peter going to say when Jesus talks about his death? What's he going to say? What's Peter going to say first? He's going to say, be it far from thee, right? That these things are going to happen to you. Right. And then Jesus says, get, get thee behind me, Satan. Exactly. So, so we have Peter representing the 144,000 being given the keys of the kingdom, the keys of the house of David, these, these prophetic keys, which we would say are these prophetic periods. We could also say that those are connected to that. But he's given this light, but he's also overconfident. He doesn't understand the need of his transformation of character. He hasn't really yet had a revelation of Jesus Christ. So he, he's, he's going to avoid the cross. And, and and if you continue like reading this whole section, uh, then it's going to talk about um, you know he that seeketh to save his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Right? That we have to take up our cross. So if in that whole section of Matthew 16, Peter confesses Jesus is the Christ. Jesus foretells of his death. And then Jesus says, if any man will, right? So right after he says, get thee behind me, Satan, he says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So so, so Peter recoils against the idea of the cross for Christ. But without the cross for Christ, we can't take up our own cross. So so you can see how how these things are so important in, in tying them together. So this is all in chapter 16, right? So it, it's it's put together here by Matthew when he writes the, his gospel. Uh, whether you know this all happened at the same time, at least we know that that Matthew is putting it together as something thematically connected. So so. We have had this experience. Now, we know that Peter also is going to deny his Lord three times. And then later on, after the resurrection, when Jesus is talking with Peter, uh, you know, he's going to ask this question three times, do you love me? Love is about me. Now, he's going to say, um, do you uh, agape me? And Peter's going to say, I, I just phileo you. I just have brotherly love. I don't have love of God, right? Then he's going to ask that the second time. He's going to say, I love you, but only as a brother, a brotherly love. And then Jesus is going to say, do you have brotherly love? You know, phileo me. And then Peter's going to say, of course you know. I, I, that's what I have. As I have brotherly love. So Peter has been humbled in the dust by these three, the three testing prophetic message. So, so Peter represents uh, 144,000. He represents this movement, this message at the end of the world. Um, and we have gone through, uh, in a sense, um, a denial of the Lord three times uh, with the, the prophecies that were given us in that 777 days. Those three dates uh, represent our three denials of Christ. But they also represent uh, this, you know, Christ asking this question, do you love me? And we come to recognize, if the glory of man is laid in the dust, that none of this comes from us. All of this comes from the Father. That, uh, and, and only then can God use us. And, and so this is going to be analogous to the three touches. Again, so all of these things tie together. So I'm sharing this because this is just, you know, flooding, been flooding my mind since yesterday. But but you can see how this all fits together, hopefully. I, and it dovetails in with a lot of the things that, that we're going to be addressing further as we go into this study. Because if we're, when, when we are prepared to give the final message, it will be a message that will go forward in unity we will have the experience that Peter and the others had in the upper room. We will go forward as Peter did to understand that there are 
messages that need to be given, but then just as as he was shown, there are sometimes messages that are presented that he didn't fully understand, as in the day when he was praying on the rooftop and the different animals were all lowered to him on a sheet. So, yeah, it, it becomes very profound uh, what, what God has been showing us. Um, but it is meant to lay the glory of man in the dust that is our glory. And, and we obviously know we're not really there. Uh, just one other thing I was, I was looking, uh, I'm just looking here at chapter 10, verse 3 which I don't think we ever addressed. Um, remember, says he says, I did, did I anoint myself at all? Neither did I anoint myself at all until three whole weeks were fulfilled. Right. Uh, the word uh, anoint, it's actually doubled. Neither, neither did, uh, so that's 5480, just, just noticing that. Now, so when we think about these three whole weeks, right, the 21 days, he's going to, uh, anoint himself, but it's a doubling. So that's of course comes after the angel appears to him, after Christ appears to him, and he, he's not going to anoint himself till then. So he hasn't anointed himself yet, but these are going to be fulfilled or filled full, right? Um, so he's just stating that he didn't he didn't anoint himself till after these three touches. Um, so it's something to consider because it's also a doubling as well. Um, so these three weeks, uh, there's probably more to these 21 days than we've even considered. I mean, we know they, they represent the 21 years from Daniel's captivity to the destruction of Jerusalem and then the 21 years from chapter 8 to chapter 10. But... Uh, it also represents something in our experience. Well, okay, now could, maybe could we say that the, could we say the three whole weeks represent uh, those three Sabbath dates: November 9th, two thousand nineteen; July eighteenth, twenty twenty; and December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. We because could. they are three because the weeks can refer in a sense to Sabbath, right? Uh, that's the thing about the word uh, weeks; it means you know. That is a week, specifically a seven, right? So uh, it's uh, Shabbat, not uh, uh, Shiva, but Shabbat. It's just a different vowel pointing, but the same consonants. And I wonder if that's that's representing the three touches in this movement. Just something to consider. There's there's a lot here that we have to consider. With some thoughts. Okay, now maybe maybe I'm going too far afield, but with that doubling that you're you're pointing out on that phrase Hebrew five four eight zero, if you divide that, so divide it by two, you come out with twenty seven forty. Okay, so twenty seven forty. If you um, yeah. If if you then consider twenty seven forty is twenty five twenty plus 220, 220, is the okay. 20. Yeah, I actually, I actually had divided it and seen that number, but I didn't do that with it. I was just trying to what would be 2740, and I didn't think about that. 2520 plus 220. Okay. So Interesting. Is, is the 2520 an anointing to restore us in our relationship with God? Well, okay. So we, we, well, we know there's 220 years that connects the 2300 to the 2520. Right. 220 plus 2300 is 2520, and then we're just having another 220. So, so somehow it's it's representing these prophetic periods. Right. Okay. But this, yeah. Uh, Interesting. I, okay. I found I found uh, what you're saying there, Dwight, in my experience, in a way. When I started learning about the 2520 prior to that, it was occurring to me that I had just been attending church year after year, and another Revelation seminar, Public Evangelism, was coming up with the church I was attending, and 
And I thought to myself, you know, I've gone to so many of these. I could sit there and I could teach it. I could tell the guy what he was going to say before he said it. I knew it so well by going so often, so many years, year after year to these evangelistic series. And I thought, is there nothing more? And my, my, uh, my Christian experience was beginning to become stale. And then my friend Peter Plum came over with a arm full of books. He reminds me of Dwayne Dewey. And he came over and he started studying, showing me these things about the 2520. And at first, I was falling asleep when he would come over. And then I woke up one time about a year later after he had been sharing these things with me. And I realized there was something to it, and it was quite interesting. And I began to get life back in my experience of learning new things about God, and it, it kind of kind of encouraged me to return to God in a way with uh, that was uh, like it was like new. Everything was new again, and I saw I saw things that I had never seen before, and. And it, it it was renewing my experience with God. So, yeah, it's kind of a neat thing there, that 220 and 2520. Well, just, you know, I'm, when, when this was being addressed, when Theodore was bringing this out, he's right. We had not addressed the doubling that was in there at all. But when we look at this, this doubling, 5480, 5480, not only do we have the four seven times, but we have four symbols of restoration. So what is being said to us in this verse? Okay, you have something that's even a little bit more interesting. Now, now if we had had um, this, not so, but if you add them together, right, uh, you get 10,960. And uh, we know that if we divided that uh, by 30, we're going to get 365 and a, and uh, a third. Okay. So it's, that is, we know 10,956 is the number of days in 30 years. That is, if you go from November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019, that's going to be 10,956 days. So, I mean, if this had been the Hebrew number uh, 5479, it would actually come, if you added them together, it'd be exactly 10,956 days. Now, it's going to be an extra four days if you take, add them together. It's going to be 30 years and four days. But the four days can represent, again, those four seven times, right? The, the four 2020s. Right. Or four 220s. Okay. So I'm just saying that it is connected to the 30 years as well, this anointing. That means that anointing is going to happen after the 30 years in that period of the seven, seven, seven days, these three, three steps. Right? Make, making sense? Yes. Okay. So. But I think it's pretty profound, um, this, uh, these two anointings, uh, that, he, you know, the, the anoint, uh, anoint myself at all twice. So it's got four seven times with the two, four two twenties, right? Or it can actually represent 30 years plus four days. And, and the four days can represent, you know, the four dates we have in that 777 structure, which the main four dates are November 9th, 2019, July 18, 2020, also March 27th, 2021, as well as December 25th, 2021, right? So you've got those four days. So you've got 30 years. It brings you to November 9th, 2019, and then there's the three more days, the three other days. I don't know. Maybe that's stretching it, but I, I don't think so. Well, when we're also... Because it's anointing and the three the three whole weeks, which we already say that could represent those three dates. 
Okay. When, yeah. when we are also considering that in the past, we have addressed that whenever we have this doubling occurring, this is again a simple, a, a symbol of the second angel's message. So, so if this anointing is a symbol of the second angel's message, is this an instruction to us directly before the third angel's message is being presented in clarity? It's just a thought. Now, well, it's definitely connected to the second angel's message, yeah. Okay. Now, Daniel okay. continues. So, I ain't did um, verse also get um, two, it's two doublings, ain't it? Be strong, be strong, and it says strengthen and strengthen in verse 19. Um, We're just about to get into that. Yeah, yeah, so you're going to have this again. But, yeah, so you have that in verse 3, and then you have it later on. Another doubling. So lots of doublings, actually. Remind me the significance of doubling, a reference or connection to the second angel's message. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And and the second angel has midnight and the midnight cry as part of it, which is a doubling. It's two way marks that mark midnight. So we know in Millerite history, originally we just had the midnight cry. But then when we found midnight, we realized that the second angel was doubled in that there's going to be Boston and Exeter, right? Boston, he actually gives the midnight cry at midnight midway, but then it's going to be empowered on August 15th, on the first day of the fifth month. Um, so that's why we originally kind of, because we always had three way marks in our line, right? We had the first, second, and third. But when it came to uh, putting that, you know, 9-11, the midnight cry in the Sunday law, then in 2015, then in 2016, we, we discovered midnight at the end of 2015. So now we had four way marks you know, 9-11, midnight, then the midnight cry, then the Sunday law. But we made midnight this little tiny tick on the line. It wasn't, you know, equal. It wasn't as tall as the other ones. It was closer to midnight because they're 25 days apart, uh, July uh, 21st, 1844, and August 15th. So, so, so we realized that that second way mark, the second angel's message, is a doubling of midnight and the midnight cry. But so they're really the same way, Mark. But one is is uh, the formalization, and the other is uh, the empowerment, because the first, eight, the second angel arrives at 9/11, if, if that makes sense. In April 19th, it arrives first day of the first month. Does that help, Kelly? It, it helps. It <clears throat> kind of clouds it for me. The simple question is: a doubling, a doubling is the second angel. Yeah, right. Message. Yeah. And because of Babylon is Basic, all, basically, is all. yeah, and and it's a okay, doubling because that's it's the connection. Second. Yeah, it's a doubling because it's the second, and it's a doubling because it's double. It's fallen, it's fallen, and 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 Revelation mm -hmm. eighteen also is going to be Babylon is fallen, is fallen, which is the second angel that arrives on at nine eleven. So, so maybe that should be clear now. So the. It it helps. Uh, so is there a tripling for the thir third angel's message? Uh, well, sort of well, thing. Well, Does it follow no. the same pattern? Or? Well, I haven't seen that. Um, but you know, the third angel's message. There's three messages, right? Um, so we can see, you know, uh, the purge made white and tried. You know, um, you know, there's all these different three steps. So you could sort of argue it maybe even with the message to the Laodiceans. You know, there's three three different steps, but that's, it's not usually like a doubling, like a tripling of the same thing, but it is the three steps represent the third angel's message. That helps. Right. I don't, I don't does know. Isaiah, if does Isaiah have the doubling in there with the woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips is there a, i'm just thinking that perhaps he has an experience there 
of a doubling. Well, okay, yeah. Didn't have so time. I mean, what I was happens to look Isaiah? That up. Yeah. So, so what happens to Isaiah? I mean, when when we get into these touches, which we'll probably do in a bit more detail uh, tomorrow. But uh, when we get into these t touches in in more detail, uh, obviously we're going to look at uh, the experience of Job, the experience of Isaiah, the experience of John the Revelator. You know, because they have this this experience of the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? The Mara, the looking glass vision. So, so you could say that you know, obviously that. That is the third angel's message in verity, right? So we sometimes just tie it to, well, the beginning of the third angel's message, justification, the loving of glory of man in the dust. But the experience of it is in the third angel, not in the first, if that makes sense. Because the first angel is justification. But, but it's still part of righteousness by faith. The second angel's message of sanctification is still part of righteousness by faith. But the third angel is when we give glory to God. That's when Christ's character is re reproduced in his people. Right? And, and so that is righteousness by faith in verity, that is in reality, in the life. So the third angel, so you know, we've misread that quote of Ellen White where she says righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, right? We just think, oh, the third angel's message is the righteousness by faith message. The first and second aren't righteousness by faith. But that's kind of how people think of it. So we just need the third angel's message because that's righteousness by faith. But you can't have a third without a first and second. Right? And, and so that's been missed within the righteousness by faith movement in Adventism is that it is actually an experience that is pro progressive. It's the everlasting gospel, right? The everlasting gospel doesn't start with the third angel's message, it starts with the first angel's message in Revelation 14, right? Would, exactly. <clears throat> would the first angel, yeah, so, would, would, yeah. would the first angel's message, would the first angel's message be Isaiah's experience when he realizes he is undone he, that he woe is me i'm thinking uh, yeah well yeah and, that, and that's the way we first it reveals our yeah. condition okay mm -hmm. yeah and we see and we see that but but they're progressive they're all part of the same message you can't you can't just isolate it in that way like we tend to mm -hmm. isolate these things. justification sanctification and glorification are part of a process called the everlasting gospel right like it's not mm -hmm. like, yep. yeah. So, right, and that's why in Revelation fourteen six, and I saw another angel fly in heaven, yeah, flying in the midst of heaven, flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Same with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. So, and that's the first angel's message, mm -hmm. and in the first angel is all three hey, messages. On. Okay, hold on. Now, yeah. I, Isaiah 6, verse 5, <clears throat> excuse me, then said I, woe is me, I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So this dwelling in the midst, that's in uh, Revelation you just read again? Yeah, Revelation first, first age, six. Yeah, midst, midst of heaven midst of the people yeah. okay and this is very interesting yeah, yeah. We're, also, we're also gonna, <laughs> yeah. and we're also going to see in yeah. isaiah you know he's going to have a live coal uh, touch his lips right, from off the altar and and daniel's going to have his lips touched as well because he's dumb right and and so right so, <laughs> There's a whole bunch of things here. I mean, that <laughs> we've talked about so far today that that are are pretty profound. And one is mm -hmm. they bring together all kinds of scattered jewels and are putting them in a setting that's that that's making them all shine brighter. Like Helen White says, uh, the the 
that old truths need to be reset in the framework of present truths. Basically, paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the old becomes new. It's new light. New light's just old light being made shine brighter, not a contradiction of old light. Thanks for that, Kelly. Well, thank, thanks for expanding on it. Sure is helpful. Okay. As we're beginning here again, in verse 18, Then there came again and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. A doubling. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Here Daniel is repeating. First, the experience, acknowledging that he is being strengthened and that he has received strength. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. The prophet is at length strengthened to hear in full the communication which the angel has to make. And Gabriel said, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? That is, do you not know to what end I have come? Do you understand my purpose so that you will no more fear? He then announced his intention to return as soon as his communication was completed to fight with the king of Persia. The word with is in the Septuagint, meta, and signifies not against but in common with, along the side of, that is, the angel of God would stand on the side of the Persian kingdom so long as it was in the providence of God that the kingdom should continue. But when I am gone forth, continues Gabriel, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. That is, when he withdraws his support from that kingdom and the providence of God operates in behalf of another kingdom, the prince of Grisha shall come, and the Persian monarchy will be overthrown. Gabriel then announced that none, God of course accepted, had an understanding with him in the matters he was about to communicate, except Michael, the prince. And after he had made them known to Daniel, then there were four beings in the universe with whom rested a knowledge of these important truths. Gabriel, Daniel, Gabriel, Christ, and God. Four links in this chain of witness. The first, the highest being in the universe. The last, a member of the human family. Verily, the whole race is ennobled by so noble a member. The fact here stated shows the propriety of the language of Revelation 1.1, where Jesus Christ is introduced and Gabriel is spoken of as his angel. He was the angel who alone had acknowledged, had knowledge with Christ of these revelations, which were to be made to his people. I would agree with Smith to a point that Gabriel was the only angel who had this knowledge with Christ, but Christ had received the knowledge from the Father himself. And from that, Revelation 1.1 is most clear. Any other comment or thought? Okay, well, going back now, I don't know why he goes into the Septuagint. It makes no sense to do so. I mean, you just look at the Hebrew. I mean, why does he do this? But anyway, now, we have said, of course, that we, we have the prince of Persia. So we went through this uh, before. So the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one in 20 days. But lo, that's verse 13, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, or the Michael the archangel, came to help me and remain there with the kings of Persia. Now, now this word, um, so we have the word with, which in English can mean different things. In, in verse 13, it says there, with the kings of Persia. So we had said, well, that's different than the prince of the kingdom of Persia. 
because you know the prince is sar, right? Sometimes in this case it is in verse thirteen, and then the kings that's Melek, right? Like in uh, uh, Melchizedek, right? That's got Melek in it, the king king of peace or king a uh, king of uh, righteousness. Pardon me, Melchizedek, and he's also called the king of peace. That is the king of Salem, right? Um, Salem being peace. Shedek being righteousness. Anyway, so we got that word Melech. So he's going to remain there with the kings of Persia. So that word is 681. Now later, we're going to have, he says, fight with the prince of Persia in verse 20, right? So he says, well, the Septuagint has the word meta, and it means on the side of, right? So in verse 20, though, we have a different word uh, than the 681. So if you look at uh, 681 again, so in verse 13, that's the word etzel, which means in the sense of joining a side, right? So that means Michael is going to be on the side of the kings of Persia, right? But he's going to be withstood by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. So it's not the same person, right? That is, the prince of the kingdom of Persia is not the kings of Persia. And But then in verse 20, uh, we have again the word with, but it's a different word. Now, so the Septuagint translates it as the word meta, right? Sort of like... Uh, What's meta again? Well, he's he's Isn't trying it? to say not against, but in common with, along the side of. Yeah. Now, now the yeah. So uh, the Hebrew word is. Um, here, I got to click on this again. Just hang on. So now we say fight with the prince of Persia. It, it's it, if it was six eight one, it would mean that, right? Now. I'm just trying to get this weird. Give me the one nine seven eight. I have to type it in. I don't know why it's not doing anything. Okay, just hang on. Um, so this this word is translated in Job twenty three verse six as against. Right. So will he plead against me with a great power? No, but he would put strength in me. Can mean within. Job 6, verse 4. It's also in Job 23, 10, as translated as take. Uh, oh, pardon me, I'm actually got the wrong. So it's a related word, so uh, just a different form. So 5, 9, 7, 3. Uh, 36 times it's translated against. Eight times it's translated among. And five times before. Four times as beside. Uh, four times as whom, two times as all, two times as between, two times as like, two times as toward, right? Once as a company, once as at, once as behalf, once as long, once as mind, once as minded, right? It's a preposition, right? So, so it can often with prepositions and that is in, in conjunction with, in varied applications specifically, um, E equally with, often with prepositional prefix, and then usually unrepresented in English, accompanying, against, and as, before, beside, by reason of, for. So there's lots of different ways in which it can be understood. Now, in the context here, this would have to be, he's going to fight against the Prince of Persia, because the Prince of Persia is the one that he was fighting against already, right, which we said was Satan. So I doubt that um, that Gabriel's going to fight on the side of Satan. No. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, I think maybe the way that Uri Uriah Smith is understanding is the Prince of Persia and the King of Persia is the same person, right? He's just probably thinking that. And so Gabriel's going to be on the side of Persia when Persia, uh, uh, when I'm gone forth, lo, the Prince of Grisha will, shall come. But we know it's actually, you know, Grisha doesn't really uh, come. Persia is going to go against Greece and lose. 
So I guess Gabriel isn't very effective if he's going to be on the side of the, the king of Persia and Persia lose, loses to Greece. Uh, it doesn't really make any sense. So, so it makes much more sense that the prince of Persia, he's going to fight against the prince of Persia. So by going to the Septuagint, he gets misled, right? Well, the, the thing, I'm, I'm sitting here right now using dictionary.com. Mm -hmm. And the the definition that they're giving here is that meta comes from the Greek prefix and preposition meta, which means after or beyond. When combined with words in English, meta often signifies change or alteration, as in the words metamorphic or metabolic. Yeah. So... Yeah, so when I look at Meta here on my Greek dictionary, the Strong's, um, and he's correct, it is translated Daniel 10, 20 in the Septuagint as Meta, 3, right. 3, 2, 6. A primary preposition often used ad adverbally, properly denoting accompaniment amid, vocal or causal, modified variously according to the case, that is, is the genitive, Association or accusative case, succession. I always hated Greek because of all these different cases uh, with which it is joined, occupying an intermediate position between and all these different words. Um, but it can be translated lots of different ways depending on context and so forth. But even his whole idea of using meta in the way that he has done is misleading. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm not really sure why he why he wants to do that. I mean, I mean, he obviously doesn't see this as the prince of Persia is Satan, right? which which I understand why people wouldn't. They just say, oh, he's using calling you know Cyrus the prince and sometimes Cyrus the king, but but Cyrus is the king, the king of Persia, and then it's also going to talk about the kings of Persia, which we know then would be. The, the kings that are either following or, um, you know, just Cambyses and Cyrus, both being the kings of Persia. But uh, but this, definitely the prince of Persia and then the prince of Grisha, uh, this, that to me has to do with the fact that Satan is in charge of the kingdoms of this world. So it's, I mean, we went through this before, but it's just, he, we can see that Uriah Smith doesn't quite get what's happening there. Exactly. Now, comments that were made from the chat. At this point, the question was asked, meta as in Facebook. Since meta is the new corporate identity for the holding company that has Facebook, WhatsApp, and several others. That, that's what I was asking. What is meta? Right. Yeah, I'm asking that same question. So I would I would have to say no, but then the the question was asked, just wondering how they use it, why that choice of turn. Yeah, so they're using the Greek. That's why they're calling it meta. Now, so I would think that that is, I mean, exactly what meaning they're getting out of that. I think has to do with more just the idea of like meta, how do we use meta? It's like, because we use it a little bit differently in English. Now, when you looked up the word meta, when you were looking at dictionary.com, you're looking at it. So meta of a creative work referring to itself or to the conventions of its genre, self-referential. Right. The, the enterprise is inherently meta since it doesn't review movies or examples. Or it's just, so, I'm not sure why they chose that meaning, but it, it's when something refers back to or is about itself, right? Like a book about books or a meme about memes, as what one other dictionary, dictionary.com says. Um, so there's the actual meaning of meta, um, right, as a Greek word. 
but but the idea in English is showing or suggesting an explicit awareness of itself or oneself as a member of its category. So so the words come to mean something different than the Greek word. Right. Uh, another one of the pop, more popular uses of meta today is the meaning best described by the formula meta x equals x about x. So if we take the word data for our x and add the pre prefix meta to it, we get metadata or data about data. Right. So this self-referential idea. So I'm pretty sure that that's what uh, uh, Facebook is using the word meta in that sense. But uh, it has nothing to do really with the Greek word meta. So then the question is counterfeit of Satan. And then a quote looks like from the internet, as in 2021, rebranded <clears throat> as meta based on Facebook's PR campaign. The name change reflects the company's shifting long term focus of building the metaverse, a digital extension of the physical world by social media, virtual reality, and augmented reality features. I know that uh, speaking with my son and uh, his friends of that generation, of his generation, this meta is quite a big thing for them. They are thinking of that this is how the world is going to be. It's going to be a virtual reality that we will never leave our homes or our computers space sort of thing. AI is going to take over and we will have a metaverse rather than a universe. It's, it's, it's a real thing for the young people. Okay. Now we've come to the end. Of forgive the ra for, for, forgive the rabbit trail. Not a problem. So, so just one other thing, you know, one of the things I hate is, uh, just talking about the, the, the way that words change. So, you know, it's, we got the word there, virtual reality. Well, what does virtual mean? To me, this- Same as, but not real. Same as, but not real. Okay, so it, it's come to mean that, right? That something that's, that's not real. But, but virtual as, as originally as a word, um, has to do more with reality, not something that's not real. Right. Uh, uh, so let me see here. Right. So, so, I mean, we get the word virtue. Virtual and virtue are related, right? So it's, it's, it's something that's uh, like high virtue, you know, morality, right? Um, so, you know, so virtual reality should be real reality, not fake reality. But it's come to mean, because we just say, well, virtually. But when we say virtually, we used to mean like more like actually, right? Not, but now it's it's changed its meaning. So, yeah, it's, it's not, uh, uh, anyway, so that's. But 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 they want virtual reality, which means to them something that's like reality but not actually. Virtual reality for them is also like a utopia. Now I don't know if all of this aside yeah. is connected to to what we're discussing in Daniel, but well, I, I, I think the point the point that, that I'm, I'm wondering trying to make. Well, what, what I'm saying here is it, well, it doesn't directly relate to it, except that, that well, you know, we know that people don't want to have reality and people don't want to face reality, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. when we, we, we behold Christ, we see ourselves as we really are. The people live in a fake world, a fake persona. Um, but that's what the world wants. It's it's actually avoiding the cross. But yeah, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's a little bit of an aside, but I, I, I think it's kind of interesting. Definitely doesn't when it, break when it's, to it. And, and presently today, it, among, among this generation, they're combining it with uh, AI and, and a 
amoral universe that, and immoral universe, and you've seen this in Josh's posts, uh, no free will. Like, we are in a matrix, basically. It, the the uh, Hollywood has had quite quite a lobbying effect on the on the way people are thinking. Yeah, well, th this generation lives in a fantasy world. Yeah, I'm wanting answers to the problems that are that they can see, but the answer they're coming up with is not an is a non-answer. It's like we don't have to well, answer it; we just won't deal with it. It'll be a yeah. We we can just create our own fantasy insulated. reality. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And thinking they are connected with yeah, others. We, and that's why, yeah. So so in so in reality, there is there is this reality that exists of who God is and everything, and that's all denied by this generation. And and of course mm -hmm. the consequences of that are catastrophic, um, you know, psychologically speaking. Um, not know God, and uh, to have a to live in a fantasy world. So I mean, that's where transgenderism and all that stuff comes from. It's part of that fantasy world that you can just create whatever reality you want. You you, you can deny actual physical reality that you're a man or a woman. And, and just live in a fantasy, and and that becomes real to you. That's part of post postmodernism. But uh, mm -hmm. but God wants us to live in reality. Yeah, yeah, he wants um, us to see things. So when we look into the law of liberty, when we look into this mirror, when we look at Christ, we're going to see ourselves as we really are. And in, in a sense, man has always lived in a fantasy ever since the Garden of Eden. When Eve mm. saw that the food, the tree was good for food and desired to make man wise, right? And and they saw mm -hmm. things differently than they were in reality. Um, so so the gospel helps us see reality, and and real things are more meaningful than things that aren't real. I mean, you, you can't live on imaginary food. In the dream, if you try mm. to eat something, it doesn't even have taste, right? Mm. I've been hungry well, sometimes. It doesn't taste uh, like anything. After ha having uh, lost a sense of smell, I now to enjoy the forest, that part of it, when I walk through the woods, I imagine that smell. And in my memory, I actually experience <laughs> that smell. But uh, the Three angels' messages is the answer to this metaverse, isn't it? It's it's a yeah. to give that not only in word but in in example lived out in our life. That will be, <laughs> you know, perhaps the thing. It will be the thing that will wake up. Yeah, and we need this, this touching, this you metaverse. know, this touch, which we're gonna we're get get into a bit more detail goes through that. Hey, thanks, Kelly. We probably should. And here, Dwight. So, okay. all right. I'll ask a question, but I'll just sure. wait. I'll just wait. Until... What's your question, William? I just wait until the mall and ask it. No, go ahead. I was going to ask about midnight and midnight cry, but I'll just ask it tomorrow. I should hold up the subject. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll talk about it tomorrow. Just remind me. Okay. All right. Thank you, and shall we now close in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this study. We thank you for the conversations. We thank you for the participation. We thank you for your leading and for the protection of your angels and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Direct us now through our day. May we have the strength that we need to accomplish that that you would have us to do. Be with us in all things. Help us and return us so that we may continue in this study tomorrow. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.